Hi everyone, my name is Ophir. Uh, I work for Google. I'm um, joined here today by my colleague John Aid. Uh, my brave colleague John Aid. It's now 2.30 a.m. Uh, in California. And today I'd like to talk about a topic that nobody cares about, specifically security, uh, more specifically speculative execution attacks, and even more specifically address space isolation. Uh, we first presented this topic in um, LPC and KVM forum about two years ago. We released an RFC. Since then, a lot of things have happened. There have been quite a few new um, variants of speculative execution attacks. Uh, what didn't happen is any interest or adoption of other space isolation, ASI, unfortunately. Uh, and I hope I can um, slightly change your mind uh, today. So speculative execution attacks, like they started with Meltdown and Spectre, and this uh, page is a bit out of date because I think there are a bunch of new um, icons that have joined. Um, and those attacks kind of like typically give you a compilation error in your head when you try to understand them because they don't make any sense. What do you mean that user space can just access kernel memory? What do you mean that a virtual memory can access host physical memory? Uh, because those attacks are microarchitectural attacks. Like we used to think about what does the architecture give us? We can add and subtract numbers, we can multiply, we can divide, we can do branches. But underneath the hood, the processor is doing a bunch of crazy things. And I want to do like a quick survey here in the audience. Who thinks they understand well speculative execution attacks? I see one, two hands, three, maybe four. Okay. Do you think you can write a proof of concept code? Okay. Oh, that's also a few hands. Nice. Um, yeah, so most people don't understand it. And I'm going to do one more quick survey. Um, with the new vulnerabilities, what do you think is the performance impact? If we use the new mitigations, like all the mitigations that we have. Yes, KP. Oh. So he said, uh, too, late. too late. Anyhow, like AP said about 30% if you use. Um, if you do an indirect branch prediction barrier on uh, on security boundaries, I mean, that flushes the whole architecture state. It's really high. Like these, these are implemented in microarchitecture and take 2,000 to 10,000 CPU cycles. And the impact of not having the predictor units, like, uh, uh, it, it, like having them stateless, is really high. So 30% on workloads, even higher for something that is very interrupt driven on VMs. And and yeah, as you said, it's, it's pretty bad. And I can imagine it wasn't me, but I can imagine what happens when you go to your uh, company leadership and say, hey, you remember this vulnerability disclosure we got? Don't worry, we got this, we have a mitigation. It's 30% performance impact. I, I believe you're not exactly the employee of the month <laughs> when you do that. Um, and the state of affair right now is that the mitigations are quite un unacceptable. And um, I think at least publicly speaking, I don't think many companies are using like those civic mitigations that can reduce 40% of your performance impact. And the state of affairs today is that whenever you have a new variant, um, basically it's months of work, uh, potentially in the order of 10 engineers or more, um, I have a colleague, which I won't mention in his name, but he said, you know, I think if we had ASI, potentially I could get months of my life back. But is there echo? Or does that sound okay? Okay. And what I hope to advocate is that we'll, if we kind of like try to rethink ASI or think that maybe it's a good idea, then instead of months of work uh, and instead of, um, I think I have some numbers here, for example, no, actually before that, yeah, I think here the numbers I had here down below is that at least some public patch, for example, was 52 files changed, 1600 uh, lines changed. And I'm, I believe that with ASI, if we try to use ASI, every new vulnerability would be between three and 10 lines of code, probably a single engineer, maybe a bunch more testing to make sure it, it works. And probably not m any new significant performance impact. So ASI does have performance impact on itself. It's between 2 and 14%, at least by our measurements. Uh, and ASI is also a performance, uh, a mitigation technique that you can actually get better. So even if you have 10% performance degradation, if you invest a little bit more effort to expand the, the allow list uh, about what other spaces are allowed to be accessed, um, you actually get better and better performance as you invest more time in it. I want to show a little bit of graphs of at least some experiments I ran. Uh, this one is on Redis. So the blue line is the, is the baseline, 
uh, it used the full mitigation, including uh, stopping the sibling cores. Uh, the performance, at least on, on Redis, was about 87.5%, so that's 12.5. Uh, if we decide we don't want to halt the sibling core, then the performance degradation is a bit more than 2%. Um, this is on Aerospike. Um, if we stun the sibling core, whenever we have an ASI exit, um, we get a little less than, than uh, 7%. Um, and yet another performance number, for example, for this FIO, again, something like you know 1%, maybe 8%. Um, and hence, it seems very appealing, definitely compared to a performance impact of 30%. Uh, and I'm going to go a little bit into ASI details uh, in a few more slides. Uh, and we understand that ASI is a bit of a pillow, <laughs> a bit of a pill to swallow, specifically because uh, it requires a significant modification to uh, memory management. Specifically, we had to modify uh, K malloc and D malloc implementation. And um, we need to kind of like mark areas in memory about what is sensitive and what is not sensitive, specifically in the implementation we released in the RFC and what we tried now is basically assuming that all memory is sensitive and contains secret, except for stuff that we say are non-sensitive. So basically we need to go to various K malloc and V malloc sites and say, okay, this thing is not sensitive, this thing is not sensitive, this variable is not sensitive. Um, and again, in a few slides, I'll get a little bit more into the technical details. I'm skipping them for now because we presented it uh, in the past. Um, but now let's kind of like jump a little bit um, into what are speculative attacks and how does uh, ASI uh, suggest to mitigate it? Uh, any questions before we dig, we dive into those technical details? I think, yeah. No, great. So speculative attacks. So roughly speaking, uh, there are quite a few papers about speculative attacks and we can divide it into like three stages. Uh, the first phase is basically accessing a secret um, it can be either uh, by an architectural instructions or speculative uh, instructions because of branch confusion. And the second step is trying to leak it, uh, classically by trying to signal through the L1 cache, for example, what was the byte that we read. And the third step is the attacker actually figuring out what was the number that we actually read. Again, there's a bunch of papers about it. I personally have one that kind of like tries to dig into the details of how those attacks work. And basically what we're trying to do with ASI is to kind of like limit the exposure of secrets. So yes, we may uh, access uh, secrets, but we want them to not be leakable. We want to make sure uh, the system in a very specific sta uh, state when we can access secrets. And when we go out of that specific state, we want to scrub the secrets to make sure that uh, a malicious VM cannot access them. And the general idea of ASI, uh, which is not so surprising is to use page fault as a way to distinguish between speculative access and non-speculative access. No speculative execution path can actually execute the page fault handler. Page fault handler. Meaning uh, if a speculative access is trying to access memory that is not mapped, there's no mapping between the virtual and physical, the processor can't really give you the data. Like the processor has to walk the page table in order to understand what is the physical address and potentially bring it from cache or for memory. Um, and this is what ASI uses. And the general idea is that we're going to basically only map a memory that we deem to be non-sensitive. Um, and only when we need these other pieces of memory, only then we're going to do uh, a swap of the uh, page table and we map the entire uh, other space. And the premise of ASI is basically that most of the time, um, even when we access kernel memory, we only access very specific kernel memory. So if we think about two guests or two VMs, then we have VM exits. Typically, guest A needs guest A stuff and guest B needs guest B stuff. There's also a little bit of other memory that maybe is common to many VMs, but is not too exciting, like the file descriptor table, potentially. And um, that's the general premise of, of what we're trying to do with, um, with ASI. And let's see what actually happens, uh, at least in our implementation for KVM. We want to do uh, jump into uh, a VM, and before we actually uh, do the VM enter, we call ASI enter, uh, which basically means we're going to flip the page table 
into a page table that only contains non-secrets and things that belong to this specific guest. And when we have a VM exit, uh, before we can do any field execution, so first of all, technically we can just run, and if we don't touch any sensitive memory, um, nothing happened, we didn't pay any penalty. And if we have an interrupt that touched some sensitive memory, or we have a code path that touched some sensitive memory, then we're gonna have an ASI exit. And the nice thing about using an allow list is that basically we don't need to think too long and hard about what, what are secrets. Uh, we just need to think a little bit about what are non-secrets. And we have a framework and a mechanism to discover what are those non-sensitive pages. And I'll go into that in a few more slides. Um, but before that, a little bit of technical details. So for example, uh, what happens on a page fault? Uh, so let's say we're trying to access some memory that is not in our mapped non-sensitive memory, uh, then we need to do an ASI exit. And before we do an ASI exit, we have the pre-ASI exit, which will stun the sibling call, meaning it's gonna send an IPI and make sure that the sibling call is not executing anything, to prevent a state in which you have still a, a VM running trying to steal information. And uh, the last second line here is actually an addition that I added for, for Redgrid, for example. Before we do the ASI exit, we're gonna flush the branch predictors, and um, that's kind of nice. Instead of, of doing changing 52 files um, and 1,600 lines of code, adding the few lines of code that will just flush here uh, the branch predictors, that, that's probably way easier than what we had to do um, for WebLead. Um, what happens on a re-entry uh, to, the, to the guest? So we, we flush microarchitecture buffers that we think might leak secrets. And if we have new variants and we think we need to flash not just the L1 cache or the uh, write buffer, then we can add a line here basically that says, you know what, I need to flash one more microarchitectural buffer. Uh, and again, this addition is way simpler than uh, the mitigations we had to do for new variants that have been discovered over the past two years. And, and finally, you, you basically tell the sibling core, okay, you can resume execution now only non-sensitive memory uh, is in the microarchitecture buffers, and we're now only mapping uh, the limited page table. And now the question, I guess the way more than a million dollar question is how do we discover these non-sensitive pages? So basically the way we went about it is, is looking at uh, a bunch of things. Uh, one of them is kind of like looking at the ASI exit versus VM exit. Basically like a default mitigation that was I think proposed is just flush the UARC buffers on every VM exit. So ideally we want this ratio of ASI exits to VM exits to be way less than one. And when we have those ASI exits, when we have those page faults of accessing non-sensitive memory, there are two questions we wanna ask. First of all, um, who's accessing the memory? Uh, and second of all, who allocated the memory? And if we know who accessed the memory and who allocated it, then we can actually say something about, is this actually sensitive or non-sensitive? And here's an example of analysis we've done on Redis. So maybe it's a bit hard to see, but these are, um, these are ratios between uh, ASI exit and VM exits. And on, um, yes. Yeah. Quick question. This is when you're measuring ASI exits, yeah. you've already found some audited code paths and you're taking a ratio of the ASI exit to that or? So yes, that's right. That's run after uh, our pass of already marking. Uh, so when you start first, you have like 100% ASI exit to VM exit. Got it, yes. yes. Uh, and this is after like a task we did, and this is on Redis. Um, this is on, I believe, uh, 16, actually we have, I think we have eight cores here, eight CPUs. And the ratio here is between, depending on the specific CPU, between 1% and, and 25%, or well, I guess we have 50% here. And of course we want to take this number uh, way down. And this is how we evaluate how well our uh, allow list is like basically we want to take these numbers as low as, as possible but at least we have a way to measure how much we need to pay in order to run uh, SIC. Um, here's another uh, analysis that we did on Redis uh, basically we wanted to see um, what code paths creates the most ASI access so this thing here is a CDF security distribution function so this access was the most frequent one uh, in the specific run 76,000. And the lower we go, we have the code paths that created the, the less the less amount of uh, SI exits. And obviously we wanna uh, deal with the big hitters first. 
like you want to kind of like prioritize, let's deal with the ones that makes the most ASI exits. And we also know, for example, okay, uh, which core path access it. And then we can kind of like look at the code. We, our framework kind of like tells you, okay, this is the code path that accessed uh, this memory that caused an ASI exit. And this is what we believe. We have an estimation about uh, what is the K malloc site or uh, the D malloc site that caused it. And with those two, you can actually say something about the memory. And also, you know that like, okay, I may need to add here this annotation of GFP non-sensitive because I think that this memory that's being accessed, if a malicious VM will try to read it, I don't think that presents a threat uh, either to uh, other VMs on the machine or uh, as the host, uh, Google. And yeah, go ahead. Oops, yeah. yeah. VMs in here. Um, yeah. Where is the, like, the user space attacking the kernel side of this? Is that also somewhere or is that just not the as The user important? space stack, the user space stack, not the kernel. I'm saying, you, um, so you're talking about VMs leaking data to each yes, other yeah. um, is the main case here. VM, at or, least in my mind, a malicious VM wanting to steal data either from the host or from other VMs. Yeah. So what about user space and the kernel's interaction here, where user space is trying to attack the kernel and get data out of the kernel? So from a VM or not regardless of VM? Uh, just bare metal. Um, bare metal so guys. we believe we can uh, extend ASI to also replace a KPTI. Uh, we have not done it yet. Uh, David's more complicated. A uh, short answer. Yeah. ASI is pretty much about how KVM does exit and what mapping is changing. If you do it for more generic use case, it's kind of revamp entirely how kernel handles kernel page tables. Okay. Yeah, uh, Jomnade, I think Jomnade is uh, online. Do you want to say something about replacing KPTI? If we can, uh, do I need to do something to let Jomnade speak? Or, uh... Is it? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, as Ophir mentioned, so um, we do think that we can extend it to user space as well, using the same principle. Basically, uh, uh, like we can map memory that's accessed using most system calls. Um, it's uh, one thing that's kind of not yet clear completely is. Um, how much memory we'll need to map. So with, with user space processes, I mean, there's a lot more system calls than there's like types of VM exits. So we will probably need to map a lot more memory. Um, and which means that we might need to do some sort of automation to actually do the analysis that we just mentioned. Because doing that analysis manually uh, uh, is going to be much more time consuming. Um, so that's something we are still looking into. Uh, and another thing we are also actually looking into is if we, can also like possibly like switch to a deny list approach instead of an allow list approach. Uh, basically, like everything is non-sensitive by default, except for explicitly marked secrets, um, and that would be much easier to do for let's say user space processes because then we don't have to analyze a whole lot of different code paths. Yeah. Do you have an idea of the scope of? I mean, how many lines of code are we talking here that have to be modified to do VMs versus user space, for instance? I mean, we're talking. Hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands? Uh, no, I, I don't think it would be that many. Um, so like in terms of the infrastructure itself, I think it's probably going to be like a small number of hundreds. Um, like in terms of more, and like just in terms of the memory annotations, it can be much more. Um, but again, so memory annotations are like, uh, uh, like if you, for example, switch to a denial space approach, then even there isn't even going to be a difference in the memory annotation either. And is this just KPTI? I mean, the there were lots of ways to leak stuff out of the kernel from user space right. from some of these attacks. So uh, is this just KPTI or is this everything? Uh, we could uh, we could do certainly we could do things beyond KPTI as well. So it, um, it basically like depends on what you uh, do in your ASI uh, entry and exit handlers, right? Um, so if there are like any other mitigations um, which we can avoid by simply flushing some particular micro artificial buffer. Um, or you know, flushing some branch picture or whatever, uh, we can add those in the in the ASI and TNX handlers, and then we can remove those existing mitigations. It I also think that for Cisco entry exit to doing ASI entry exit will be way more expensive than doing this for VM entry exit. Um, it's 
probably yes but um again it depends from on what the... i tried it was like 10 times more expensive but uh... right but yeah. it, it depends I mean... on what you have mapped right so so you don't need to do and on every single syscall right you only need to do it when your syscall touches something which is not mapped in your mystic address space uh, and if you and, and that's certainly a challenge like because we will need to map a lot more in order to look at reasonable performance for syscalls uh, so and that's certainly a challenge so uh, but if we assuming that we do map all the things that are commonly touched by the various syscalls then at least in theory it should be able to get reasonable performance right uh, well, depend, it depends on the how you divide sensitive versus non-sensitive. Yeah. Right. Uh, if you have a lot of sensitive, then the uh, performance will go down. If you have uh, most of memory unsensitive, then uh, there is no performance hit, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, I think like the the uh, the other question is: Have you tried comparing the other approach of the denialist? Like, have you tried doing the ASI? Uh, to VMX at ratio of zero to hundred. So I think the leg is trying. Uh, to kind of like implement the nice approach, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but we haven't have anything that's working now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, I'm still working on it, but we haven't really tried it yet. And do you have examples of code paths that you consider as sensitive and the ones you not don't consider as sensitive just for the audience here? So, so um, if you kind of like, act, first of all, in most VMX, it's nothing is actually interestingly happening. Like basically, you had like a timing interrupt that didn't do anything interesting. Um, maybe you access some file descriptors, but didn't actually access data or files. Um, then most of them are, are non sensitive. If you're sending something to a network, potentially to another VM under your control, uh, then also it's non sensitive. Um, most of the time it takes that creates a VM exit basically are non sensitive. Um, we have like an example, um, I believe we did publish in the RFC our list of uh, non-sensitive, right? Um, but most of it is file descriptor tables, something about networking at least between VMs. Uh, most timing interrupts don't really require you to have an ASI exit. Okay. I, I was wondering like if, if you're writing to an MSR, for example, from the VMX, if you're intercepting an MSR, right? That would be potentially where you so, to be extra careful, right? Yeah, but in MSR, um, I, I'm kind of like half guessing now. I don't think that's a, would that be a sensitive right to an MSR? Uh, that's user controlled input, even after you flush yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can, uh, um, you can control input. And if you find a gadget that can load a register from your MSR, and then you can have that input being used in another gadget in the follow up. I see. That, that suggests, I guess, that MSRs contain sensitive information. No, no, oh. it contains user controlled input. So yeah, if yeah. if you have your sensitive yeah. information always unmapped, yeah. then, but my question is how do I find where the sensitive information exists, right? This is. So you're talking about the deny list approach, not the allow list approach. Whichever, like, how do I find so, the location? So, the so with allow list approach, it's, it's kind of like, I guess it feels a bit more comfortable because every memory that you add, you've seen what it is and who allocated it and who accessed it. And that way you don't need to say, hey, maybe, you know, I don't care where the secret data is because everything is a secret, except for what I just specifically said is not a secret. If you're K trying to go the next, so. KP, sorry, you're also considering different threat model. Uh, the the ESI mostly, if, as far as I understand, it works against the infiltration from the alpha data from, guest or, from other guest or, or host. And you are talking about a threat model where there is a, one VM can control the execution of another VM. No, I'm talking about the guest to host thing itself. Uh, but it's not infiltration, it's rather control. It's not stealing information, but changing, modifying the behavior. It's, you know, it's an info leak. So what I'm saying is I, I do an MSR, right? Mm -hmm. I intentionally write something to the MSR that I want to be in, let's say, R1 register at some point, right? Then I, then I do a branch target injection, right? At the MSR, right? And I take this, and use this MSR load oh, to load R1, then use another gadget that I can, where R1 is used for like an MMAP call or something. And then I have an info leak there. So it's, it is very speculative. Yeah, but, the, but the data has to come from memory. Yes, yes. yes. That, that is where the sensitive and unsensitive. Yeah, yeah. So at least I believe, unless I'm mistaken, is since if we're taking the allow list approach, everything would be unmapped. Yeah. And once, okay, you can control the gadgets, you can control the speculation path to do whatever you want. But once you actually want to access the data, the processor will not have the mapping of virtual to physical, and it won't be in every cache either. Um, 
Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, we basically uh, done at least with the slides and, and at least we're trying to advocate that, that maybe we should reconsider uh, swallowing the bitter pill called ASI, even though it's, it's kind of like a non-trivial mechanism. Um, I'm, uh, yeah. I missed this and I'm not that active in this area, so forgive me for my probably stupid questions, but what was the original reason for uh, rejecting this? Performance or? So I don't know if it was rejected, but there seemed to be not a lot of interest. Uh, Jomei, do you want to comment about that? Uh, yeah, I don't think like, uh, I mean, we haven't like seen anybody explicitly saying that we don't want this. It's uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it's just as of itself, so there's, it hasn't been, uh, there doesn't seem to be like any interest as such. Almost here? So, no. So I'm one of the uh, x86 maintainers. I, oh. I looked at this. So, I mean, the reason that I didn't like it and it doesn't merge now is because it's a lot of code. It's a lot of future commitment to this stuff. And there isn't really broad use for it. Like you said, this doesn't even like consider this as called path, which we, you know, kind of care about. So, uh, I, it, I mean, it, it, it looked really, really interesting up front until I started to see the details and how much code this has to change and how much of a permanent maintenance burden in every little corner of the kernel this is going to induce. No, also, we have uh, separate syscall entry paths now, right? We have the regular system calls, but we also have IO Uring. Not even considering that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole separate thing. Yeah, true. And I think we're running out of time, so thank you very much, Ophir. Thank you.